What's going on, everybody, and welcome in to this edition of B Shape Daily. Oh man, Brendan Schaefer here with you. The evening hours of Sunday, June 4th, 2023. And we're talking about a cardinal sweep at the hands of the Pirates. This is not good, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. This is not good. If you're a Cardinals fan, it ain't good. As the Cardinals fall back to 10 games below 500, they're now 25 and 35, seven and a half back in the division. And instead of closing the gap on the Pirates, a gap that was, oh, I don't know, three and a half games or so to begin the weekend, I think the Cardinals were actually four games back of Pittsburgh. Well, now there's seven games behind the Pirates. You could have trimmed that gap. You could have trimmed the gap on the Milwaukee Brewers. You were only trailing them by four and a half games. I guess you couldn't have trimmed it, but you could have kept it the same. The Brewers have now picked up their pace of winning more baseball games, and the weekend against the Reds will do that for you. It'll do that for most teams. Of course, the Cardinals played the Reds pretty recently and split a four-game series against Cincinnati. Yeah, it's all just kind of rough right now if you're a Cardinals fan, and we'll be talking about it all tonight on b Shave Daily. Appreciate you guys for being here. Make sure you're following the show on Spotify. Love waking up and seeing a few new Spotify followers for b Shave Daily, and we've gotten that recently, so thank you to y'all who have been following over there, Apple Podcasts, and to the YouTube subscribers. Appreciate you guys for helping us get over 1,000 on YouTube. I know some people were asking about whether we'd have a live stream on Sunday night, and I did think about it, but full disclosure... I've got to get up incredibly early on Monday to travel out to Columbia for a golf tournament, the Cougar Club and Scholarship Fund annual golf tournament out there at Columbia Country Club. We'll be doing the big show out there on Monday afternoon from 4 to 6 as part of the festivities going on there. So excited about that, but it's a couple-hour drive for me, and those live streams usually tend to go till about 1 a.m., Sure, I could have started it earlier, but my wife and I were watching Better Call Saul. If you've never seen Better Call Saul, especially if you've seen Breaking Bad, you need to do it, is my first point that I would like to emphasize. But for those who have seen it, Season 6, Episode 7 is the one we just finished up, and my wife's jaw was on the floor. She's watching through it for the first time. So yeah, that that was intense. But like I said, I had some things to do tonight. So we're just doing the audio podcast, but we'll have this up on YouTube as well if you'd like to have the YouTube app open and listen to the show that way. That'll be an option for you. And I'm hoping, I'm really struggling with getting uh, things together with Google and it's a program called AdSense and they haven't approved me even though I've got 1,000 subscribers, yada, yada, yada. I'm hoping to be able to get all that sorted out relatively soon. I don't know how long it will take, but I'm still hopeful to be able to get it done. And then we'll be able to do more cool things on the YouTube live stream and different features that will be unlocked. So stay tuned for that. But appreciate you guys for being here. So let's talk Cardinals. There are some things the Cardinals did this weekend that I think were nice, were exciting, right? They recalled Jordan Walker. That was something we talked about after Friday night. So that's nice that they did that. He should be here to stay, even if he has some trouble, even if he struggles, which he has a little bit so far. Had an 0 for 4 on Sunday. Not the end of the world. I want to see more of Jordan Walker allow him to work through some of those issues, I think should be the way the Cardinals approach it. They also gave Luke and Baker an opportunity. What do you know? After all this time, they finally made the move for Sunday, and he goes two for four in his major league debut, two for four with a strikeout. Congrats to Luke and Baker. I didn't know if this moment would come with the Cardinals. I thought it'd be more like a DFA and and end up somewhere else and, and start thriving over there. We've seen that before with the Cardinals. But Luke and Baker is at least getting his cup of coffee right now, and I, who knows whether it's going to be sustainable to have him in the lineup. But it's just like it's unbelievable to me that it took the Cardinals as long as it did to. I think it's a little crass to say get rid of Trace Pereira, but to have to have him on the roster, and I don't know if they if it, part of it is they couldn't send him down without putting him through waivers. I I assume that's the case. Otherwise, why? why put him through waivers unless he, I, I assume that's the case, but even, even if that is the situation, which I think it is, I don't understand why it took them so long. He didn't play guys. He didn't play at all 
I think May 24th was the last game action he had. Checking out the box scores here, that is accurate. He was here for nearly a month and took two plate appearances. Two in, well, about a month. Today is the 4th of June. His first game action was the 6th of May. I don't remember exactly which day they called him up. But basically a month of action on the big league roster for two at-bats. And now we're supposed to give the Cardinals credit for doing it? No, this was a move that happened way too late. It was insane the entire time to have him on the roster. Not a reflection of him as a player at all, but a reflection of the Cardinals roster management this season, which has been poor. It has been subpar. And there's really no way to talk yourself around that at this point. I mean, there's just no defense of it. And it's, again, it's often not the end of the world. But it just kind of gets under your skin, doesn't it? When this team is 10 games below 500. Like I've told folks on the podcast multiple times, hey, the 26-man roster, guys, is not the end-all, be-all thing to be using as a lightning rod for this team, for the things that you're upset about. The 26-man roster is largely, it's consequential when you're looking at the final guy on that roster. But how many times do the Cardinals have to continually waste that spot before we go, eh, I don't know. (laughs) It's probably fair to talk about it. Probably fair to bring it up once or twice. They did it for a month with Barrera. They did it with Taylor Motter for like a week and a half when he didn't play after sending down Jordan Walker. And it's fine if you're winning and doing those things. And I don't know what John Moselak would have to say about it. I assume he'll talk Friday night, probably. But given my role with KTGR, I will be late. You know, I'll be showing up at game time for Friday night's game. So if there's an afternoon powwow with Mo, I won't be there for it. We'll see if that ends up being something that gets brought up. My guess is this happens in the middle of a road trip because then Mo doesn't really have to talk about it, right? Like, this is Sunday. Friday will be the first time the Cardinals are back home. Tres Pereira will have been gone for five, six days by then. And so I don't even know if it'll come up, if it'll be like, hey, why did it take you so long? But it's just like the Cardinals will treat it as though, well, I mean, it's just, it was a minor, minor thing and we fixed it now. So no, no problem. Like those are kind of that. Doesn't it feel like that's the way that sort of move gets discussed? And it's true. Like it's so minor, but if it is so minor, why not fix it and get it right? Or at least have the opportunity for some utility to that roster spot. I'm not saying that Luke and Baker is going to be all that valuable to this team. I don't know in either direction, but neither do the Cardinals until they find out. And so now that they've at least given him a spot on the roster, we'll see what he's able to do. But I mean, you had Alec Burleson designated hitting multiple days over the weekend before this decision comes down, right? Because I think he was the DH both Friday and Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. I know he was at least one of those days. But it's just like, Those minor moves and and little transactions, they don't make the headlines unless you are this 10 games below 500 disaster that the Cardinals have turned themselves into. And it is frustrating because I really didn't see this coming. First of all, a lot of Cardinals fans, I don't know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. It, It wasn't the starting pitching this weekend, by the way, that cost the Cardinals. It's been the same thing that it has been over the past 10 days or so now. The offense underperforming the entire weekend. But I didn't really see this kind of backslide coming after the Cardinals sort of found their way following the 10 and 24 start. Had talked about how they were like 15 and 8 over the next 23 games coming into this weekend. And then they lose, and one day you lose because of a bullpen blow up, and that's never fun. It's never what you want to see. Cardinals have got to rely upon a solid bullpen. Many times it's been to pick up the starting pitching that has been subpar. But that wasn't really the case on Friday. You got a good solid outing out of Jack Flaherty, and you lose that game because of the bullpen in the seventh inning. Talked about that in the live stream that we had on Friday night, so go back and check that out if you missed it, if you're interested. And then in the game on Saturday, I mean, Jordan Montgomery wasn't great. But again, 4-3 game, Cardinals lose that one on Saturday. Yeah, I don't know, where's the offense, man? And only one of those runs against Monty was earned. So errors playing a role. 
I mean, it was just an all-around rough weekend for the Cardinals to lose the way that they did. You lose three games. You're swept by the Pirates. In a series that I said coming into it, you've got to treat this like it's a playoff series, even though it's not. I get that it's not, but you got to treat it like it is. And the thought process behind that was you gave away too many games at the beginning of the season to have margin for error to mess around now when you only get so many opportunities against a division rival. And at, at that point, and still true today, you know, all the division rivals are above you in the standings. And so it doesn't really matter if they're a team that you figure to be in the playoff mix or not. I didn't think the Pirates were coming into Friday, but I, clearly now you got to give them more of your attention. After taking three from the Cardinals, they are four games above 500, and the Cardinals are 10 under. So can't exactly dismiss them at this point, can you? But for them to lose the series in three games and get swept the way that they did. And what was the total run differential? Like four? They lose seven to five, four to three, and two to one? That's just being outplayed by the Pirates, man. Three straight days. David Bednar, a factor each and every time. That's a team and a manager that knows, hey, these are important games. And it's not to say that Ollie Marmel didn't think they were important games. I'm just crediting Derek Shelton for going to David Bednar in these save opportunities because he's a given. He's basically infallible, uh, at least over the weekend. He had a nice he had a nice weekend against the Cardinals. Derek Shelton knows, and he says, hey, we got to go to our guy because these games matter. Cardinals, I, I, I mean, I think they knew the games matter, but they didn't play like it offensively. Nolan Gorman had a homer. That was nice. You had the Arenado backside homer. We talked about that on Friday. Andrew Kisner comes up with the Cardinals' only run on Sunday with the home run that he hit. Where is everybody else? Three saves in three days for David Bednar. Man, that is that is some tough pitching right there. Credit to that guy. But, you know, there are eight other innings in each of those games that Bednar doesn't pitch. And so I get they've got a lockdown closer, but Cardinals offensively just did not show up in the in the clutch in these situations. 0 for 5 with runners in scoring position on Saturday, and that was after, I want to say it was 3 for 9 back on Friday, but we talked about how the opportunities with the bases loaded late in those games, it, it, those are really the ones that stung if you're the Cardinals. 3 for 9 is generally not a bad average. I mean, you'd take hitting 333 in almost any scenario. But they t- they had 12 left on base and then Sunday it was even worse in terms of the the batting average. I mean, they went over again. Over 6 on Sunday with runners in scoring position, over 5 on Saturday, 8 left on in Sunday's game. I mean, that is a horrendous track record for the weekend. I'm reading here in John Denton's story from MLB.com where Ollie Marmel was asked if another downturn going on now reminded him of April when the team stumbled badly out of the gates to start the season. This is from John Denton. And Ollie said, no, not even blanking close. There's an expletive in there. I think you can fill in the blanks. And he goes on to say, no, not close. It doesn't feel that way at all. In April, we handed over a lot of games in a lot of different ways. Pittsburgh beat us three straight days. And I would agree with that. Pittsburgh did beat the Cardinals three straight days. And I don't necessarily think it's like April either. Although a couple of errors costing Jordan Montgomery on Saturday. Again, he gave up one earned run, four total. Cardinals lose that game four to three. So April was kind of marked by what? Not coming through with runners in scoring position. Cardinals were over on Saturday and Sunday combined. Errors, costly errors at times that that just killed you. Mentioned that from Montgomery's outing on Saturday. Three of the runs end up being unearned because of errors. In a game that you lose by one. So, while I understand where Ollie's coming from, I also don't know for sure that it's not like April. I don't think it is, but when it was happening in April and early May, I didn't think it was going to continue. Each day would come and I'd go, okay, surely today is the day that this is going to end and the Cardinals are going to get this figured out. And it took a lot. It took a long time. I mean, it took longer than I thought it would. They had to fall all the way to 10 and 24 to get there. And so now you lose three in a row to the pirates over the weekend. 
And that shouldn't feel good because, again, fewer opportunities against the division this year with a balanced MLB schedule. And the Pirates were already ahead of you in the standings, and you had a chance to kind of make that a little more even. And instead, you're moving in the other direction, and they're continuing to climb. You just gave kind of a a second life to this whole idea that the Pirates might be a playoff-caliber team. You could have taken that away. Again, nobody's season ends in June, even the Cardinals at 10 games under. But with the way the Pirates had sort of been trending, you sweep them this weekend, which... I realize when you lose all three games as the Cardinals, you obviously were not particularly close to sweeping that team, but with a total run differential of four for the weekend, you could change a few things here and there and and come up with a way that it would have happened. And then you're talking about a Pirates team that's now below 500, and yeah, that's kind of where we expect them to be. All is right with the world. Everything is sort of leveling out. But the opposite happened, and as a result, you do have to look at the results. You can't say, well, the run differential and well, You know, they just outplayed us, and this isn't like April. I mean, teams were outplaying the Cardinals in April. That's how they lost as many games as they did. The only difference I can spot from then and now is the starting pitching does look better. And that is a sign of encouragement. I mean, Miles Michaelis didn't have his best stuff on Sunday. Gave up 10 hits, but also it was like the first... Trying to check this, how many of those hits ended up being just singles because I think it was like the first six or so the only extra base hit Michael is allowed in the game was against Austin Hedges and it was a double and that was it so he I mean for 10 hits and nine of them to be singles I know we joke about the soft contact and it's like how can every ball that goes over the fence be soft contact no today was maybe Michael is just kind of falling victim to balls finding holes he didn't walk anybody didn't have his strikeout stuff today but a lot of times Michaelis will pitch to contact and you you don't mind that but five innings 10 hits and it's a whopper of a number and allowing two runs his ERA actually dropped I think it was 375 now it's 374 so Michaelis was fine he, I mean maybe a little unlucky but managed the damage pretty well to only allow two runs not the end of the world Again, Montgomery allowed just one earned run on Saturday, four total runs. And back on Friday, Jack Flaherty was pretty good. Could have been more efficient, but he was pretty good. Five and a third, one run, I believe, was the line on him. And we have seen better starts from this rotation over the past week or so. They've moved Steven Matz to the bullpen. It'll be Libertor getting his shot again on Tuesday. We'll see how that goes. We've got Wainwright on tap for Monday, I believe. And so the starting pitching is not... Great, I wouldn't call it a strength, but it's definitely not the major deficit that it was back in April and back kind of early May when all of this was going on and the Contreras stuff came to a head and everything was just on fire. So from that perspective, agree with Ollie Marmel that it's nothing like April. But offensively, I think it's not very far off from being what we saw in April, which was these guys at times would get base runners. It wasn't that they couldn't do anything. But they're not cashing in. How can you go over on Saturday and Sunday and expect to win a series? It's not going to happen if you go over with runners in scoring position. Over eight on Sunday, and it, I mean it's like clockwork right now. Every time these guys put some ducks on the pond, you it doesn't matter if it's one out, two out, it doesn't make a difference. You just know it's coming, and it would be kind of comical if it weren't so jarring for the Cardinals at this point. Like it's very predictable. And, I, again, it's very difficult to parse out for me whether or not, like, what do you even say about it? Well, you look at the names in the lineup, and you think they're a pretty talented bunch. I've talked about that this could be a team that the way they're built could lead the league and run scored. Now, they didn't look like that over this weekend, and they didn't really look like that last week either. I get it. Like, they're they're tumbling in terms of the offensive stats recently. And it was Rich Hill that kind of had their number. On Sunday, five hits for the Cardinals in this game, three walks, but you, you, I mean, that's not a ton of base runners. That's not what they've been having. In some of these other games, they have put up easily double-digit base runners and still don't find a way to score very many runs. And Friday, they scored five runs. And so you say, well, that was a good offensive performance. No, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. When you consider how many times they left the bases loaded 
and that they scored all of their runs in one inning, in the third inning. And so I am scratching my head at this point to try and figure out what we can or should expect from this Cardinals team because I think back to the Paul Goldschmidt quote that came in the middle of their struggles. He probably said this around late April, early May. I think it was probably before May, but I'd have to go back and find it, and I'm not going to. But I I recall what he said was you can kind of expect, well, the balls are bouncing against us right now, and that can last for a little while. But at the end of a season, I mean, a baseball season, he said, is very fair. It's a fair thing. And at the end of a season, you are what your record says you are. You can't hide from it and blame it on bouncing balls or bad luck or anything like that. And right now, the Cardinals are 3-7 and in their last 10 games, and they're not producing offensively recently. They've been equally bad on the road as they have been at home for the season at this point. And they're 10 games below five hundred, and they have the worst record again in the National League. Those are all facts, ladies and gentlemen. And so I don't know... At this point, if you can go back to blaming it on bouncing balls, even though it felt like that sort of weekend, you come through with runners in scoring position even a couple of times on Saturday and Sunday, and you win two out of three. And Friday was the game that you definitely should have won, but then you had a six-run seventh by your best reliever. Like, the margins are, are slim, but that's what I kept saying in April, that the margins are so slim in the way the Cardinals are losing these games. It's just... It doesn't feel sustainable, but if it gets sustained for a full season, then it becomes, I mean, by definition, sustainable, and then that's what it is, and that's the team that you are and the team that you were, and right now, the Cardinals have played 60 games, and they're 10 games below 500, and they have the worst record in the National League. They're worse than the Rockies. They're worse than the Reds. They're worse than the Cubs. They're worse than the Washington freaking Nationals. This is not, I mean, this is the weekend that says, there are red flags here. Sound the alarms. I had used the terminology that I was at DEFCON 1. I joked, hey, whatever the bad DEFCON is, that's where the Cardinals are right now, in my opinion. And they had come out of that, and it seemed like they were moving in the right direction. And maybe this one is just a blip on the radar, and it only feels worse, and it only feels like more dire, I guess I should say, because of where they are in the standings. Like, if the Cardinals were around 500 and they get swept at Pittsburgh like this, you go, wow, that really sucks. But I could look at each individual game and say, okay, you know, you just had a weird outing from Giovanni Gallegos on Friday. That doesn't happen very often. Chalk it up to that. And Saturday and Sunday, you could kind of tell a similar story. Saturday could be, well, there's a couple errors, and and you give up some unearned runs, and that's just kind of fluky, and you, you couldn't come through with runners in scoring position, but this is a good offense. They'll be fine. And Sunday, you go, well, man, you got a good, well-pitched game. Michaelis gave up a lot of hits, but he was able to kind of keep everything intact, only allow two runs. Cabby, Jordan Hicks came out and looked good. Three strikeouts and an inning in the third. Like, everything's everything's good here. The peripherals are really good. You just had another bad day with runners in scoring position. You couldn't get anybody home. And you could chalk that up, and it would be it would sound fine in a vacuum, If the Cardinals were around 500, it would just be a, oh, man, that's a weekend to forget. It's kind of hard not to make more out of it than that, though, because of where their record is and where where the Pirates' record is, honestly. Because I've talked about not really being all too concerned about St. Louis' ability to catch up to Milwaukee because I don't think that highly of Milwaukee, but now they've won some games. Granted, it it came against the Reds. And... uh, they still got one more game in Milwaukee. Why is that? That's weird. The Reds are hosting Milwaukee. I, I I had that backwards. The Reds have one more game that they're hosting against the Brewers, but the Brewers have taken the first three of that series, and apparently this series ends on Monday because reasons. I don't know if I've ever seen that, but that's the balanced schedule for you. They're coming up with all kinds of crazy things, two off days in a row. Cardinals have an off day on a Sunday later on this season. I have no idea. But the Brewers were playing terrible, and then they got a load of the Reds, and they've beat them three in a row. Again, and that series is at Cincinnati, so the Cardinals had that exact same opportunity in a four-game series, and they won fewer games in four than the Brewers have already won in three at the Reds. So I don't know if I make too much of that, thinking that means the the Brewers are, are all of a sudden good. I don't really think they are. I don't think they end up running away with this division. 
but now you still have the Pirates to contend with as well. Like, it's hard to pass one team when you're trailing them by seven and a half games. It can be done, certainly, with the length of calendar that does still remain. But you've also got to rely upon not only that Brewers team to play kind of poorly or just average. Now you need it from the Pirates, and you don't get to play them as many times because of the balance schedule, and you just wasted three opportunities against them. And and technically, you still have the Cubs and Reds to pass up, too, although neither of those teams really strike me as playoff caliber at this point. You're only a, a couple of games behind Chicago for third place, but you're you're sitting down there in fifth all by yourself. The Reds are a game and a half clear of the Cardinals despite losing three in a row. So that's where you are, St. Louis. I want to hear how Cardinals fans feel about it. Let me know here in the comments on YouTube and make sure to like this video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and check us out on Spotify as well. Search B Shape Daily on Spotify and give B Shape Daily a good five star review over there. But your comments, let them be known on YouTube. You can always tweet at me at bshafer12 or shoot me a message over there, but YouTube is the best place to converse with everybody and get all the Cardinals fans' comments out there. So go ahead and head on over to youtube.com slash at bshafer12. The name is the same as it is anywhere else. Brendan Schaefer, if you search it on YouTube, you'll find me. And get your comments in on this video. I'm very curious, how worried are Cardinals fans right now? Because I'll be honest with you, coming into this weekend, I was in a place where I thought, Win this series, I think it's important. I said you got to treat it like a playoff series because there's a lot of value to knocking the Pirates down a peg. Instead, the Cardinals have sort of pumped their tires. But before this weekend, I really wasn't of the mind that the Cardinals were in any sort of danger in the NL Central. I still thought they would coast to this division. Yes, even when they're four and a half back, even when their percentage points out of last place, I still felt that way. And I don't anymore. I, I still think they can win this division. I don't know that I would predict them to do it at this point. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's a tough spot to be in right now. This changed a lot for me, though, is my point. Like, the Pittsburgh series, absolutely. And maybe you can tell in the tenor of my voice and the way I discuss it that it does feel different now. That it's going to be, you know, they're going to have to scrap. And it's not just going to be conjured up magically. And the Brewers and Pirates and those teams are not just going to go away and step aside for the mighty Cardinals. Like, The Cardinals are going to have to earn this thing, and it's going to have to come from prolonged stretches of playing really, really good baseball and avoiding the kinds of weekends they just had. Because while they didn't play terribly all around, again, the pitching was pretty good outside of Palante and Gallegos in the seventh inning of of game one. Bullpen was great Sunday. Bullpen was good Saturday. Starting pitching didn't get too deep. You didn't have guys getting past the sixth inning, but I I believe all three of them allowed two or fewer earned runs. Total four earned runs for the whole weekend, I want to say was right. So I'm talking about just the starting pitching. And all the bullpen allowed, it it happened Friday. So your pitching, by and large, was pretty good this weekend. The hitting was abysmal. It was terrible. And that is kind of a trend. It's not a new thing, but before... When it was happening against the Royals and you scored two runs in two games against Kansas City, fortunately came away with a win in one of those games. But then you go back to the Cleveland series the previous weekend and they scored a grand total of eight runs, 3-2-3. Three, three. And again, we're honestly lucky to win one, but they had two one-run losses in the other games. And then you go back to the Red series, four games. Decent start offensively, five and eight runs in the first two games of that Cincinnati series, and you're thinking, they're playing at Great American Ballpark. This is a place where they should just keep posting runs and never stop. Three runs and two runs over the final two games of that series. So I'm counting back relatively far now. Cardinals have played 10 games in this stretch that I'm talking about, and they scored more than three runs in one of those games? Is that right? Could that possibly be right? The final two games of Cincy, three and two. Run scored. The the, the three games in Cleveland, three, two, three. Royals, zero and two. And then against the Pirates, five, three, one. So one of their last 10 games, the Cardinals have scored beyond three. In 10 games, that's like a substantial chunk of a season and that's what the Cardinals offense has been and it's the same offense remember that I've talked about as 
has to be a top five unit if this team is going anywhere because their their pitching collectively is just not good enough to overcome that if you're not a top five offense. The pitching can be – the bullpen can be a strength, but I think at this point it's clear they're going to need to add one or two guys at the, the trade deadline. I think Jordan Hicks can continue to be good. I think Cabby can fill his role. I still believe Steven Matz is going to be fine as your second lefty. I've said that ever since he was still in the rotation. And look at that. It's proven to kind of be true. He's doing fine. Helsley and Gallegos, you know, it's kind of hit and miss. Generally, I trust both guys. But you need you need that David Bednar in your bullpen, don't you? You need a lockdown closer. And I guess that it's probably true that those guys don't grow on trees. So that's fine. Helsley and Gallegos are guys I still believe in and can do the job. But you need a third guy that you feel like has done that job before just in case. It can be a guy, and I heard Matt Pauley first mention this on KMOX. He does the Cardinals pre- and post-game stuff for them on the radio side, and I agree with it, where he said, go after a, a reliever that's got experience in a closing role, even if he's not in one right now with whatever team he's on. As long as the guy's pitching well but and has some closer experience, I think that could be valuable to this Cardinal bullpen. And then guy like Jordan Hicks steps in. I mean, he's, I don't mean into the ninth, but he's stepping up into his role lately has just been nails for the last 10 games or so. We went over that on the live stream Friday, looking back at his box scores. He's just been phenomenal. ERA was at like seven and a half, and now it's down to 4 0. So Jordan Hicks has been great. Get you one more legit reliever, and I think the bullpen, I, I, I say strength. It can be above average. It can be a top 10 to 12 unit in baseball. I think the bullpen can be that. You can't have what Geo did on Friday continue to happen and Palante contributing to that. But I do believe still this bullpen can be one of the better ones in the game. Not not elite, but it can be top 10 to 12 to 14 to where it's not killing you. The rotation, I don't think quite has that ceiling, but it can be middle of the pack. The Cardinals rotation can can be, and this may be a little optimistic, but I still think it, it's true. It can be anywhere from the the tenth to twelfth to fourteenth to sixteenth to eighteenth best. You know, somewhere in that twelve to, to eighteen range, probably. The problem with it right now is you don't have the high end upside, and maybe a trade deadline deal for a guy like Dylan Cease. If you really say, "Hey, this is the thing that we need to get us going," we'll make this move, and maybe. Maybe the other side to that is you trade Montgomery for some, you know what I mean? Like you'd have to make some mixing and matching. And I will continue to say that as for as much as I think that could benefit the Cardinals to just have a very active deadline to shake things up. I've never seen John Moselak do it to the extent that I think it would need to happen where you're maybe trading a short-term asset from your rotation for, you know, whatever it ends up being, not just to do it, but maybe you're trading him for some more ammunition that you can put toward another trade that gets you your Dylan Cease right? Or gets you, and, and we've had people on both sides of the fence when it comes to Shane Beaver. I'm more about Dylan Cease. I know the cost would be exorbitant, but it might be worth it is sort of my mindset. But then you maybe have a rotation of Cease. And again, Cease is going to be difficult to get, but I'm, I'm feeling like the hypothetical tonight just to kind of exemplify and, and show the point that I'm trying to make about what the team could, could look like. You go Cease, Michael is Flaherty, Wainwright, Libertor, could that be a, a, a top 10 to 14 to 15 rotation? I think it's possible. Everybody's got to be pulling in the same direction, and I think you're starting to get that. Like I said, the rotation, look back over the last 10 games or so. It's not been as bad. Look back over the past maybe three turns through the rotation, taking out Steven Matz because he's no longer in the rotation. It's not been terrible. It's just been kind of fine. But fine is a... A grand improvement over where they had been to begin the season. I mean, it was, it was tough. It was it was tough. Every trip through the rotation was a, was a struggle, and I think they've kind of moved beyond that a little bit. But if the bullpen can be just kind of solid, and the rotation can just be mid, middle of the pack to maybe solid, if you're really looking with the rose colored glasses, that's fine. But you have to have something that brings you to an elite level. Like, what's the thing that makes this team a playoff team if they don't really have a playoff rotation, not a top 12 rotation or so? Bullpen's probably not top 12, although I, I could see the pieces falling into place if you made a trade. And really, that's the only way I was saying it about the rotation, too, if you made a trade for an elite arm. But now we've got Mo making two trades and maybe a third one because we said, well, to, to put in Dylan Cease 
and get the ammo for the trades you need to make, you might also have to send away somebody like Montgomery to a team that needs pitching. Plenty of playoff contenders will need pitching, and they'll look at you and go, "Well, the Cardinals, you need pitching too." And they'll say, "That's fine. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna handle this in another way." But that's like three different trades. Oh, and I think the Cardinals could use an outfielder, like a legit bat. That's four trades. Back to reality land after a, a quick detour into fantasy land. I don't think that's going to happen for the Cardinals at the deadline because I just haven't seen. We've seen Mo make like a trade or two of the deadline to reshape the team. But to do as many as I think this team might be calling for at this point based on their play, I'm skeptical that they'll be able to get that done. The other part of this, though, is can you justify that kind of active deadline for a team that's 10 games under 500 and seven and a half out in the division? And I'd re- I do realize those numbers will change by mid-June and early July and mid-July and late July. It'll be different than it is now, hopefully for the better or for the sake of the Cardinals. But, like, what's the number got to be as the trade deadline approaches for this team to go, yeah, we're buying to win now? Because that's what Mo told Jim the Cat Hayes on Bally not like a week ago or so. Said, like, we're looking to add to this team, not take away. But doesn't it look a lot different now after you lose three games against Pittsburgh? It shouldn't. It shouldn't be that way, but that's kind of how it feels. But here's my other very firm stance on this. There are a lot of Cardinals fans who hear that and go, yeah, they should just look to 2024 and sell off the short-term assets here and give up on this season. I don't think that should be acceptable for how bad this division is and how much talent should be there on the offense. There is no reason for the Cardinals to be where they are, other than that 10-24 and start. But now you're adding to it with further bad play. And really most of that bad play is coming from a fluke here and there, a couple of errors that just, you know, you you wouldn't think they'd make very often, but they happen to cost you a game on that day. A, A bullpen implosion that you wouldn't think happens all too often, but it costs you a game when it does. And then the consistent thing has been the bad offense with runners in scoring position. That's been the only thing really consistent about the Cardinals recently has been how poorly they have performed with runners in scoring position over the past couple of weeks. And what is completely bat crap crazy is that the Cardinals have, and you guys are not going to believe this when I tell it to you, the Cardinals have the second best OPS in MLB this season with runners in scoring position. That is a factual statement. The Rangers, the team they're about to see, are the only team with a better number. The Cardinals have an 838 OPS. And you might say, okay, OPS is great. They're hitting some homers probably with runners in scoring position. And they are. They have 25 home runs with runners in scoring position, second only to the Rangers in MLB. But what about just getting the base knock, Brendan? Well, they're still ninth in batting average at 265 with runners in scoring position. That's all season, though. That's, I, I mean... I don't have a way on MLB.com necessarily to break it down by month and runners in scoring position. You can probably do that on fan graphs or something. I'm not going to go through the trouble because we know what it's been over the past couple of weeks. It's been abysmal, and it's costing them because the top 10, top 5 offense has to be the thing that carries the Cardinals or you're nothing. And when you realize that some fluky things happened, some bad play happened, a lot of things combined to put the Cardinals in a bind at the beginning of the year at 10 and 24, the margin for error decreases. You can't have the same level of, ah, that's baseball. Like, the Cardinals used up a lot of their, ah, that's baseball in the first month, first five weeks. They don't get to keep saying that and having it just be true because I can see the writing on the wall now where the Cardinals will go 74 and 88. I'm just making this number up. And at the end of the season press conference, John Mosellock will go, well... If you look outside of that 10 and 24 start, we played, I guess that would be, what would that be? 500 baseball exactly. So maybe let me say they go 79 and 83, whatever that would be. And Mo would say, well, outside of that start, we were above 500, but we just couldn't dig ourselves out of that hole. And that won't be good enough if that ends up being the case. You can't just say, oh yeah, that's a good explanation. Nope, because those first 34 games count. They all count. And this is a team that should be held to an expectation to a standard of win the division. That's the baseline. I've heard some conversation of, are we kind of moving the goalposts by saying 
after that terrible start that, well, at this point, just get into the playoffs, that'd be good enough. Because before the season, all off season, the, the narrative was, how can this team, when they get to October, how can this team figure out a way to win a series, advance, get back to the NLCS, and beyond? That was kind of the narrative, and that was a fair narrative. But then when you go 10 and 24, you kind of have to throw those hopes out the window. Otherwise, you feel like you're playing a fantasy land game, right? You're like, well, it would be a waste of time to talk about the day in and day out of this team and go, how can they win the World Series? Well, they should first try to not be the worst team in the National League. Like, you just have to adjust your expectations day to day. But long range, and when I say long range, I still mean just within 2023. The long range expectations should still be getting to October and doing something when you get there. That's still the standard by which this team should be graded, in my opinion. But day to day, we can't really talk like that because at this point, it's just about getting out of the cellar. If you're following this team intently, it, it would just feel, you know, you, you would look like a crazy person raving on the street to say, this team really needs to be in the NLCS. Like, I mean, sure they do, but realistically right now you have to you have to walk before you can run and before the cardinals can get back to the nlcs which should be the thing the fans demand of this of this organization and this front office they have to like win a game they have to not get swept by the pirates like we're back to the square one when it comes to those things in the way we talk about this team and i think that's the the concerning thing about the weekend because it really had a pretty decent feeling going into the weekend, even with where things had been toward the end of the 19, 19 games in 19 days when, yeah, the offense kind of cratered a little bit toward the end of the Cincinnati series, and it stayed that way all during Cleveland, and it stayed that way during the Royals series back home, but it was, well, they're gassed. They're so tired. It, you know, you can understand. They're going to get the couple of days off, and it's going to be better. Well, they got the days off, and they haven't won since. So what do you do with that information? And you look at the reasons they didn't win. Well, nine games, or I'm sorry, nine runs in three games. So no offense. Bullpen implosion on Friday. A couple errors on Saturday and just no offense with runners in scoring position. And then Sunday, good pitching. Miles gives up 10 hits and still figures out a way to keep you right there in it. You get a home run from Andrew Kisner, and that's all you get. No offense with runners in scoring position. You could call it a fluky weekend, but the Cardinals have lost the luxury of being able to say that with, like, a straight face. They can, but until they then turn around and beat the pants off the Texas Rangers, which is one of the best teams in baseball right now, and then they come back to Bush and sweep the Reds. Like, you're losing. It's very difficult to say sweep a team. That's not a fair expectation going into a series. I don't care who you play, unless it's the Oakland Athletics. When they play Oakland, that'll be different. That should be the expectation. That's a historically bad team. But even the Reds, who, again, they're above you in the division, so who are you to look down on them if you're the Cardinals? But even a team like the Reds at this point, the Cardinals have painted themselves into a situation where you almost have to say they need to sweep this series when they play the Reds next weekend at Bush because if they don't, it's going to be all that much more difficult to make up the ground later against teams that aren't as bad as the Reds. Like You have to take advantage of your schedule when you get those little breaks in it. I'm not saying at Pittsburgh is a break because the Pirates have been playing good baseball this year. They're four games over 500. The Cardinals are 10 below. So you got to you got to realize where you're at if you're the Cardinals and you're not that kind of team right now. So to look down upon the Pirates and say, "Oh man, you really it doesn't really work that way." But from just a perspective of if you want to be one of those teams vying for the NL Central or vying for a playoff berth or vying for a World Series, You can't get swept in Pittsburgh. You can't really get swept anywhere, but especially by a team in the division. It's not because it's the Pirates. It's because they're in the Central. Any of those Central teams, you got to take advantage of the games against them because there are fewer of them this year. In the past, it meant you could beat up on those teams because there were some bottom feeders. Now there really aren't any bottom feeders in the division. There are still some bad teams, but everybody's kind of, you know, everybody's kind of in that mix. But if you're the Cardinals, man, that is a wasted opportunity and almost regardless of the way it happens, I guess the best way to put it was would be that, like, for me, the Cardinals have lost the luxury of being able to explain their losses. And you're still going to lose baseball games, but when you lose three in a row, the explanations kind of fall on deaf ears. I bought it when the Cardinals said, you know, we're tired. And they didn't say we're tired, but they were asked about it, and all the marble said, yeah, guys are gassed. 
the rest is going to be valuable. Like, I, I was totally about that. I said, you know what? Makes sense. But you have to show something on the other side of it, don't you? Otherwise, what what was it all for? It just it just sounded nice. And the Cardinals have had plenty of moments this year to, that did not sound nice. They have had bad PR moments. They have had bad messaging when it comes to certain player personnel decisions. And like they get a little they get a little bit frisky when you when you talk about them like that and they don't like it. It's like, well, why would we, you know, why would you criticize that? You know, they didn't think the Contreras thing was going to be a huge deal. They didn't think like they probably don't think the, the Barrera thing is a huge deal. And, and in the grand scheme, it's not, but it's like all these little things that add up. You look at it and you go, how are we not supposed to criticize what's going on here? 10 games below 500. I've said the whole way, the Cardinals are winning this division. No doubt. Doubt crept into my mind over this weekend only because of the math equation that's beginning to form. I guess it's beginning to reform because it had been there and then they sort of fixed it. You go 15 and eight after a 10 and 24, you're still a losing team, but you can start, you can sort of build the case for, Hey, this is actually who the Cardinals are now. They're not that team. They were at the beginning. They're this team and they fixed their issues. And maybe that's still true. And this was just a fluky weekend of not coming through with runners in scoring position, but it happened against the Royals too. They scored two runs in two games against one of the worst teams in baseball. At home, that was at Bush. You know, Cleveland's got some good pitchers, but they they scored eight runs in three games in that Cleveland series. And over the final two games in Cincy, they scored five runs. So you're averaging about two runs a game over the past 10 games. That's a sizable chunk of your season. That's more than you can just wave away as, oh, it's just kind of bad luck. Balls aren't bouncing. I think the players are still good. I don't know whose job it is individually to step up, but it's got to be all of them because you are the offense that your numbers say you are. And right now, to the Cardinals' credit, I mean, overall this season, it's not actually as bad as it feels because, remember, the Cardinals were that top five offense before this downturn about a dozen days ago. Now they have a 753 OPS on the season. That ranks ninth in Major League Baseball. So still in terms of OPS, which is not the only stat, but it's a good one, they're top 10 offense. The Cardinals have scored 282 runs on the season. That is 10th in MLB. They have scored more runs than the Toronto Blue Jays, and we saw them the first weekend of the season. They've got a nice lineup. The Cardinals have scored more runs than most MLB teams at 282. And I'm looking at some of the teams above them, some of the teams below them. Cardinals have played 60 games couple teams above the Cardinals, the Yankees, and the Angels have played 61. So, I mean, that's about a fair number. Look below the Rockies have played 61. Everybody's within a couple of games in that area. I think the Cardinals are about 10th. I, I, I'd have to look at runs per game and, and check it out on a different website. But they're about 10th. I mean, they are still, even as we speak, after this pretty rough 10-game stretch offensively, a top 10 offense, give or take. But that's why I say the Cardinals, and I tweeted this out over the weekend as they were potentially giving away Saturday's game, which they did. At that point, I said, if the Cardinals aren't a top five offense by the end of the season, they're going to lose 85 to 90 games. And that seems a little crazy because you could say, well, Brendan, what if they're top eight or 10? Like, that's still pretty good. I I just don't think, even with like middle of the road bullpen, middle of the road starting pitching, which seems very plausible. I think both those things could happen. I think the bullpen should be a little better than middle of the road. I think the rotation can be decidedly average the rest of the year based on guys coming around. They don't have really the ace caliber names, but they've got enough decent arms. Like, they can be middle of the road. But right now they're 10 games above 500 with the top 10 offense that has already existed for this team. Like, they're 10th in run scored. That's already happened, and that's where has it gotten them? To 10 games below 500. Well, what about... The pitching side. They're 17th in MLB in ERA at 4.28. You combine the 10th best offense and the 17th best pitching, and that ERA is both starter and reliever. That's combined. They got a 4.28 ERA, which ranks 17th in MLB. If you combine number 10 in runs scored and number 17 in ERA, that team should not be 10 games below 500. So where are the losses coming from? Is it flukiness? And and at the end of the year, the, John Mozeliak will be sitting in front of a microphone saying, 
Well, we had the eighth best offense and the 16th best starting pitching. So it just really was a bad luck that we only won 77 games. I don't think that should be I don't think that should be something that Cardinals fans accept. I know it won't be. And if he's having that conversation, the next words out of his mouth also might be, which is why I am, you know, taking a reduced role or whatever. I've talked about the possibility that if this year doesn't get fixed, I don't think Bill DeWitt fires John Mozeliak like some of the angry Cardinals fans want to see. And I'm not saying that you're totally out of line for wanting that if you want it. I'm just saying it's not something that I necessarily advocate for, but I also view it as something that it, it, it could come to fruition in maybe a little bit of a different way. If they have a really bad losing season this year, last time that happened was 2007, and they did fire the GM that year, Walt Jockety, and then Mo took over. This year, though, I could, I mean, if it doesn't get fixed, Bill DeWitt and Mozilla could come together and say, you know, this could be, this could be time for somebody else to try and get us back on, on track. And we will have Mo sort of step into more of an advisory role from the remainder of his contract. Like, I'm, I think that's something that realistically could happen if the Cardinals don't fix it this year. I'm not predicting that it would happen. I'm just saying it very well could go that route if they end up losing 85 to 90 games. And I think the offense has to be the thing that gets more consistent. But right now it's like they have the numbers, 10th in runs scored, 9th in OPS over the course of the season, number two in OPS with runners in scoring position. But they don't have, it doesn't feel day-to-day like they're doing it that way, right? It doesn't feel day-to-day like they're just about to they're, they're just this unstoppable force that they're going to score in multiple innings. The one day in the last 10 games when they scored more than three runs was Friday when they scored five, and they did that all within one inning. And that was their crowning achievement offensively for the past 10 days. The numbers might be there cumulatively, but for the Cardinals, I think there should be a concern at this point about the consistency and the ability to just get the runs when they need them. Clutch hitting. You might even be doing it with runners in scoring position, but it's easy to do it when you're scoring 18 runs in one game and 16 in another. I think they they had those two results at, at different points this season. I bet your runners with scoring position average is going to be awesome on those days because it's just a hit parade. But it kind of does tilt the scale a little bit in your favor and makes it look more makes you look a little more polished than you really were over the grand course of 162 when two or three of those games are going to skew the numbers in your favor. What happens over the rest of the games, I think, is a fair question. And so maybe that explains part of the numbers, but it still doesn't seem like it should be as lopsided as it is for a team with those kinds of numbers among the league's best with risk, 10th in runs per game, 9th in OPS, and even 17th in ERA. Like, even from a pitching perspective, they haven't been abysmal. If you're 10th in ERA, I can look at what it would be starters versus relievers because I feel like starting pitching ERA is probably still a little lower, a little lesser. They're 19th in starters ERA at 4.68. I think that gets to 15th or 16th by the end of the season. We're seeing an uptick in that productivity, 4.68 ERA. And so the bullpen's probably been a little below four in ERA. But like overall, you're kind of near the middle. When it comes to pitching, how are you 10 games under? I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, 397 in ERA for the bullpen. They're at 15th in uh, bullpen ERA. I don't know how to describe it other than to say they have not been clutch. They have not taken care of the big situations to push them across. They haven't. It's like they're a team. You describe young organizations or teams who have lost for a while as, oh, you, you've got to learn to win. you got to learn how to win as an organization. You might be talented. You might take steps forward. But it, but it's tough to really, in that first year of a, of a rebuild, kind of getting back on track, you got to learn how to win. That's a nice narrative. I mean, the Baltimore Orioles don't seem like they need any help learning how to win. They're just playing good baseball, and, and as a result, they're winning. They're 37-22, and 22, one of the best teams in baseball by record. That's a young team or a team that has not historically succeeded. They're not having much of a problem. The Cardinals have, all they've done is win over the past 20 years or whatever it's been. 
John Mozalek has never guided a losing season. You realize that? As the head baseball executive, he has never been the guide of a losing season for the Cardinals. And he took over in, like, October 2007, October, November, whatever after that season. They haven't had a losing season since then. But the Cardinals are acting like a team this year that's like, they, oh, they got to learn how to win. Nobody's saying this. Nobody's making this commentary. But it, it feels like that would be the way you'd view a team performing like if you strip away the Cardinal uniforms and the Cardinal name, and you just look at the outcomes of these games, it's like, Oh, they must have a young team, a team that's just kind of having, having trouble getting over that hump, learning how to win. It is the total opposite, which is what makes it so difficult to like analyze and have a viewpoint on. I didn't do a lot of predictive stuff in this podcast today. And I appreciate you guys for listening. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube because Good, bad, or ugly, we're going to have a lot to say about this Cardinals team the rest of the season. You'll be getting your daily Cardinals content here if you're interested in that. This is the place to do it. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and like this video. I didn't do a lot in the way of predictiveness because I don't feel super comfortable with that, with where the Cardinals are right now. I was very steadfast as of probably Friday. You could have caught me and said, this team is still going to win the division. It's all good. I... I still, if I had to, if I had to put it down and, and pick a winner, I would still choose the Cardinals to win this division. But I don't say that with nearly the confidence that I did. And so I'm not trying to get predictive at this point, but I'm saying that this weekend sh- did shake my confidence in what I expect from this Cardinals team, because as much as they still, to me, have more talent than everybody else in the division, for 60 games they've done squat with it, and 60 games is more than a third of an MLB season. You're closing in on what would be the halfway point of an MLB season in another three weeks or so. I I can say all day, I can say till the cows come home that the Cardinals have the best roster in this division. It doesn't make it true if after 80 games, 100 games, 120, 140, after 162 games, they're in last place. And like, I don't expect them to be there after 162, but they're there after 60. They are there a game and a half clear into last place on their lonesome after after 60 games. And so it has to come from all of them. Miles Michaelis, reading some of the quotes that he had after the game, still seemed upbeat and positive. But these guys, I think, can acknowledge after a weekend like this that whatever gains they thought they had made, and there had been some. Again, they were 15-8 and eight over the previous 23. But whatever gains they thought they had made, this maybe can at least be the wake-up call of like, oh, this isn't going to happen automatically. I think that's got to happen for the offense, though. And that's what's so crazy because, again, they're still 10th in runs scored. Over the course of a season, they've been good with runners in scoring position, but they, they, had, they haven't been recently, and certainly over the weekend, they were not. And it might feel like maybe that's part of the human element of this that makes it difficult because if you're on that offense, you're saying, well, look, we've done our job this year. It's the pitching that ranks much lower in a lot of these statistical categories. You can't have that mindset. If you're a player on the – and I'm not saying they have it, but I'm saying you can't slip into that because if you're on that offense, it's on you to make it right. Even though you've got better numbers collectively than what the pitching has contributed so far, the way this roster is built, the offense has got to be the strength and it has got to be elite. If the strength of your team is your offense but you only – finished 10th, 11th, 12th, and runs scored, and your pitching is so-so, and you can't seem to find a way to win those close ones, it's going to be a long summer. And at the end of the day, you are going to underperform your talent by a dramatic margin. Another stat that I wanted to look into, and now I've got it pulled up, when thinking about this Cardinals team and, and the things that have gone wrong, and what I'm about to read off can be a very kind of finicky stat. There is luck involved. But there's also, I think, a skill set involved in being able to come up with wins in one-run games. Win by one, lose by run, that's a, a record that you that, that gets tracked and you can judge how you did in one-run games over the course of a season. I'm looking now, and the Cardinals are 6-13 and 13 in one-run games this season so far. And there's only one team that I can spot going through this list that is worse than the Cardinals in terms of win percentage in one-run games. Cardinals are 6 and 13. The San Diego Padres are 3 and 11. And it's really interesting because they're kind of going through something similar. They're only 5 games under 500 at 27 and 32. Cardinals are 25 and 35. 
two and a half games off that pace, it, it appears. Yeah, two and a half games behind where the Padres are. But that's a team that had big expectations and they've underperformed and they've lost a ton of one-run games. Circle that. I think it matters. I think it means something. You lose the close ones, it means you're finding ways to lose. You win the close ones, you're finding ways to win. Some days you will have deserved the one-run loss, and in reality you should have lost by five. But there are other days, and I feel like the Cardinals have had plenty of these, where they probably should have won by one or two or three runs, and they're losing by by a run. And it might be like it. And again, some of these aren't one-run games. They lost seven to five on Friday, should have won that game. But there are plenty of instances where they have these games on lock and they're finding ways to lose. Some of that is anecdotal. Some of that is random flukiness of a baseball season. And you can have a year where you're you're worse in one-run games than you should have been. But, like, to me, I, I don't enjoy looking at baseball through the prism of, like, well, you just had bad luck and that was it. Not after 162. You can't use that after 162, in my opinion. For whatever it's worth, ESPN's got the Cardinals' expected win-loss rate at 30-30. and 30. They are expected, based on whatever metrics they look at for that, to be a 500 team. And if you told me, hey, the team is 10th in run scored and 17th in ERA, what do you think their record is after 60 games? I'd probably say, eh, probably about 500, probably about 30 wins. So that tracks. But whatever's happening in between, read between the lines, that's where the Cardinals are losing these games. And they're seven and a half back, and they have the worst record in the National League. This is not predictive. This is a podcast where I have I've spoken for an hour trying to just talk through some of the things going on with the Cardinals right now in very big picture terms like we haven't gotten in the nitty-gritty about a lot of players or a lot that happened over the weekend because I just don't think it's all that valuable I think it's just a very big picture look in the mirror kind of moment for the Cardinals where if they're going to get this thing on track kind of the way they had it back on track honestly even in, even against Cleveland and against the Royals it's not like they were getting completely blasted off the field. They went two and three over those five games, which isn't great, but such slim margins from being a three and two stretch. They had Helsley blow the game in Cleveland. Like the, things could have been different and you could have seen this team at three and two over that stretch and you'd be saying, see, they're still trucking in the right direction. What we've seen offensively over the past 10 days, you could chalk up some of that. And I say 10 days, 10 games. You can, you can chalk some of that up to the fact that they had, been a little run down toward the end of the 19 games in 19 days. It's not an excuse from what we saw over the weekend, and it does have to improve, and it's a hard thing. Hitting a baseball is a hard thing, so it's like throughout a game, I feel like sometimes Cardinals fans are overly critical where it's like, guys, it's the third inning, and you're saying, oh, here we go again. But right now, it does kind of feel like that here we go again. And so there is, it feels like there's almost no way to overreact to it if you're a Cardinal fan because what you're seeing could very well be dooming the team inning by inning at bat by at bat, pitch by pitch. They've got to take better ABs, and they've got to capitalize and cash in. I, It's an easy thing to say, a harder thing to do, but I almost do believe it's that simple. If they're not taking advantage of these opportunities with runners in scoring position regularly, they've got to be top five as an offense in baseball. So that is the same thing that they've got to be with runners in scoring position. They've got to continue to be a top five team with risk, which, again, in terms of OPS, they have been. I think they need to be more top five in batting average because that's what's really valuable. If your OPS is great, if you're hitting bombs with runners on, they score lots of runs, it's probably how you get some 18-run games. They've got to be one of the top five batting averages with runners in scoring position because that tells me the amount of times you're you're coming through with the opportunities. Not too predictive. Maybe this podcast was a bust. I don't know. But I just after this weekend, it was a weekend that sort of changed my mindset of, Again, on the big show, on uh, KTGR, weekdays from 4 to 6, and maybe I'll have to talk about this on Monday. I had said that I would put the Cardinals about 80% chance to win the division. This was like a week or so ago, maybe two weeks ago. 80%, I said. And Andy tells me, my co-host, oh, you're crazy. I mean, look at the the math would not support that. And I go, I know. Fan graphs gave him maybe like a 30% chance at the time. And I said, I think it's more like 80. And... That was basically, you know, statistically, if you were making bold claims like that, that's like, oh, it's a lock. They're going to win the division. I felt very confident. Now, I think, I, I mean, I'd still lean the Cardinals because I'm insane and I'm stubborn and I just don't think the Cardinals should be playing as poorly as they have been. And no, for the people that say, oh, somebody's got to be fired. Nobody's going to be fired before Monday. I promise you, it's not happening. 
the guys that are in charge of this are going to have to guide them through it. And I'm stubborn, and so I kind of tend to believe that it'll work out. But do I think it's an 80%? Heck no, not anymore. I don't know what the number will be. Tune in for the big show on Monday, 4 to 6 on KTGR. Check us out on KTGR.com. Andy will probably ask me for a number. I'll have to come up with one. But it's not 80. I can promise you that. This weekend did change my view, and there were red flags scattered throughout. You've got to come up with those close wins. And the Cardinals' peripherals and the underlying stats can say they're, they should be right around 500, but they're finding ways to lose these games right now, and that's going to cost them if it keeps up over the course of this season. Appreciate you guys, as always, for listening. That is going to do it for this edition of the show. Thank you, guys. Make sure you are following us on Spotify at Be Shafe Daily, and subscribe on this YouTube page. Give a like to this video and make sure you're locked in here. YouTube.com slash at pshafer12 for daily Cardinals content all season long. Thank you guys so much once again. That's going to do it for this edition of the show, and we'll talk to you next time on Shafe Daily. Peace.